Good morning. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18 will be our text this morning. We're going to start reading in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18, but we'll focus primarily on verses 21 to the end of the chapter. I'll go ahead and read the text for us, and then we'll say a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. So again, starting in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and, and I'll pay you everything." And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience on me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw that what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also... My heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for your word. We are so thankful that you have not remained a mystery to us, but you have revealed yourself to us in your word. Now, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand what has been written here to understand the words of your Son so that we could be people who forgive. We could be kingdom of heaven people. So God, please uh, work a miracle as the word of God is is preached this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've got Matthew chapter 18, 21 through 35 in front of us. It's going to be the main text that we focus on this morning. Uh, We read the first part just to give us some context as to what came before this passage, but we're going to be focusing on mostly the parable and then the the material that's immediately before and immediately after the parable. So uh, I've split this into four sections, and these will just serve as headings to kind of organize our time through this text. First, we'll look at Peter's question, the question that Peter asks at the beginning of the text. Second, we'll look at Jesus' direct response to Peter's question. Third, we'll look at the parable itself, the parable of the unforgiving or the wicked servant, it's often called. And then fourth, we'll look at the conclusion that Jesus offers for this parable. After we get through the text, we'll we'll take a brief moment to ask two or three questions in terms of application of this text. But let's begin. So first, looking at Peter's question, I think it'll be helpful first to take a moment to kind of figure out where we are in Matthew's gospel. So Matthew's gospel can be divided into, and this is how New Testament scholars typically divide Matthew's gospel, into five discourses, and then narratives or story elements that go along with each of those discourses. So if you look at kind of an outline of Matthew's gospel, 
you'll see these pairs of Jesus teaching, an extended teaching passage. And then with that will be some sort of event or story or narrative portion uh, that's coupled along with it. And you'll see that repeated over five times. This passage takes place in the fourth of those five discourses. So again, we're getting kind of towards the end of Matthew's gospel here. We're getting towards the, the Olivet Discourse, which will be the final discourse, and then the events of the crucifixion and resurrection. So this discourse, Jesus is typically or mostly dealing with issues of uh, the new community, the new church community. So you'll see actually in Matthew chapter 18, earlier in the chapter, um, you have the disciples talking about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus talks about temptations to sin. We've got the parable of the lost sheep and how Jesus deals with sheep that are here and that have not been lost and then sheep that have been lost. And then we come to this passage, the, the part that we read, in verse 15, where Jesus is dealing with sin as it takes place within the church, within the new corporate community. And so in this passage, we have Jesus kind of giving out his, his marching orders to his disciples. Uh, how things will operate in the church, in this new community. And then, after we've looked at how the church is corporately to deal with sin, we read that part, how the church is to deal with sin, Jesus promises that he'll be with them as they're dealing with sin. Then, we kind of get to an individual level. So he dealt with corporate sin. So, you know, someone sins and the church is kind of involved there. We've got, it's a big passage for church discipline. Now, Peter's question kind of makes a transition where we're getting to more of an individual level. So it's not, okay, we've got one person sinned against another, and we've got to take it before the church. Now, Peter's asking, okay, well, let's say, Jesus, that that situation plays out. You know, someone sins against me. I approach my brother or my sister about it, and they repent. You know, we don't have to exercise church discipline. We don't have to treat them as a, a Gentile or a tax collector. Uh, how many times do we let that play out before we you know, kind of cut them off? I mean, because if it repeats itself, it kind of seems like the person's insincere. So how many times does this happen, Jesus, before we say, enough already? So Peter's question kind of brings us into this, this individual sinning against one another. What's the dynamic there? And so we're assuming that Peter's question, and, and we'll read it here, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? We can assume that this question includes kind of two things. First, we assume he's talking about brothers because he says, how often will my brother sin against me? So we're assuming here, okay, he's talking about sin within the Christian community. Second, we're assuming that he's talking about repentant brothers, because again, the previous passage showed him how the church is supposed to deal with an unrepentant brother. Someone who says, no, I I'm not sorry for what I did. Even when it's brought before the church, they refuse to repent for their sin. Jesus has given instructions on how to deal with that person. We're assuming that this is someone who has sinned, apologized, repented, to try to make that right with the person, and then they did it again. How many times does that repeat Jesus? Before we say enough already, that's Peter's question here. So Peter's question transitions from a kind of a, a, how the corporate church deals with sin to how individuals deal with sin in repentant brother sin situations. So in Peter's question, we kind of hear an assumption that there must be some kind of limit to the number of times we allow a brother to sin against us. You hear he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Peter's assuming there's got to be a cutoff point at some, at some point or another. Because, and imagine, a lot of times Peter kind of gets a bad rap because people say, well, you know, here comes Peter. Do I forgive seven times? And Jesus says, no, Peter, you're thinking wrongly about this. Come on, Peter. Peter's not being stingy here with forgiveness. Imagine a scenario in which someone sins against you. That person repents, asks forgiveness, you forgive them, there's peace. They do it again. They, they come to you, they say, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I did that again. Uh, whatever the nature of the sin may be, you, know, you gave me that information, I misused it, or I said things to you that were just so unkind. I, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did that a second time. I, 
I'm, please forgive me. Okay, fine, I forgive you. Forget about it. They do it a third time. Now, at this point, we kind of start to want to draw a line and say, okay, apparently your repentance, your apologies are insincere and hollow because you apologized, I forgave you. You apologized again, I forgave you again. Here we are a third time. Come on, man. Let's, let's get it together. But I'll forgive you. A fourth time? A fifth? A sixth? A seventh? Seven times to be transgressed by someone, to have that person apologize to you and for you to forgive that person, that's no small feat. So I don't think Peter's being especially stingy with forgiveness here. I think Peter is going above and beyond what normal people would say is reasonable for forgiveness in interpersonal relationships. I think Peter is giving a, a, a big number here with seven, not a small number. And so I don't think we should look at Peter as being uh, stingy or um, unforgiving in this, this question that he's asking. I, I think Peter is Peter's giving a lot of slack giving seven times. Well, let's look at Jesus' response. So we've seen Peter's question to Jesus' response. His response gives us our first opportunity to kind of stop and do some reflecting here. Jesus says, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So, as every preacher, I think, has ever said when dealing with this text, obviously Jesus doesn't literally mean 77 times. After that 77th time, you're done. That's not what Jesus is saying here. In fact, I think we have an idea of this um, in, in another instance, in another gospel, where Jesus says something similar. It's not the same instance, because this parable that we're going to look at only takes place in Matthew's gospel, so this isn't like a, a parallel passage. This is something else that Jesus says in a, different, in a different place. In Luke 17, Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Well, that's an easy step-by-step -step process, right? Someone sins against you. How am I to handle this? Well, let me approach them about it. We have Jesus saying that in both places. And if my brother or my sister repents, Jesus has very clear instructions for me. Forgive. Listen to what he says next. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So you hear what Jesus is saying here. Think of the, the, the thoughts that arise in your heart when someone wrongs you, apologizes, turns again, wrongs you again, and apologizes again. Seven times in one day. And Jesus has a sense of that. That's why in Luke 17, I think he includes that word must. Because he knows that's not our natural inclination. Our natural inclination is after the third time, maybe the second time, perhaps, some people even the first time, to say, no, okay. You know, we've had this conversation already, today, twice, so you're done. No, Jesus says, if he turns to you seven times in the day and says, I repent, you must forgive him. And again, I don't think Jesus is giving us some sort of standard here to say, okay, after the seventh time in one day, we're done. So some sort of 49 times or seven times in one day, sorry, pal, it's over. No, I think what Jesus is commending Peter to do here is to stop keeping count altogether. I think Jesus is saying, Peter, be done with counting the wrongdoing of your brothers. Enough with the seven times. Those seven is a generous number. Seventy-seven. A hundred and seventy-seven. Seven thousand seventy-seven. Be done with counting. So, I think this is just another way of Jesus saying, Peter, love your neighbor. Because when the Bible gives us an idea of what love is, we go to 1 Corinthians 13, often read at weddings, why? Because it gives a true picture of what love is in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love does not count up 
wrongdoing. Uh, the ESV might say, love is not resentful. It doesn't resent you for things that you've done. Love does not keep count of sins against itself. And I think this is what Jesus is commending to Peter here. He's saying, Peter, enough of the counting. Love doesn't count up wrongdoings. Stop keeping count. But I think we're very, very prone to this. I think if you examine your relationships with those that are closest to you. So husbands, your relationship with your wife. Wives, your relationship with your husband. Kids, your relationship with your parents. Parents, your relationship with your kids. Relationships with friends or close church members. I think we often kind of keep a scorecard of wrongs done against us. And we may not even realize that we're doing it most of the time. So right now you may be thinking, I'm not really... I don't have on call a bunch of sins that have been committed against me by my wife or husband or friend or family member. Wait until you get into an argument with that person. Wait until that person sins against you again. Wait until you feel like you have been wronged by that person. Then we start to pull them out. Here's one, two, three, four ways that you've wronged me. How about when someone comes to you in loving rebuke, saying, brother, sister, I love you. I'm not doing this for any sort of gamesmanship or anything, but I genuinely feel like this is an area of your life where, where you're, you're not doing well. We start to, oh, you're going to say that to me? After you did this and that and this? I can think of three, four ways in which you need to be the one working on that, buddy, not me. That's what our heart tends to do. You ever notice that in yourself? Is that a reflex you have? Whenever you feel like you are being wronged, unjustly accused, we immediately want to pull up the failures of the other person. That's what Jesus is referring to here. What are you doing? You're keeping count. You're keeping score. I do it. I think many of us do it. I think it's a natural inclination of the human heart. But according to Jesus, that's not what Christians do. That's not what love does. Our temptation is to pull up those things in some sort of heated conversation or any case in which we feel like we've been wronged in order to vindicate ourselves by pulling the other person down. Saying, hey, hey, how are you going to approach me about that when you're the one that... And we list. We got the scorecard. It's ready. And even if we don't feel it all the time, whenever some pressure is applied, it comes out. Listen to Matthew Henry, Puritan commentator. He says, There is something of ill nature in scoring up the injuries we forgive, as if we would allow ourselves to be revenged when the measure is full. It is necessary for us to pass by our injuries without even reckoning how often we forgive. God multiplies his pardons, and so should we. So, if you find yourself in a a situation, or if you find that you just have a, a propensity, an inclination to take offense to keep score of wrongs against you, to to drudge them out in order to vindicate yourself or win an argument. Brother, sister, repent. Jesus commends you to repentance for that. Don't just say, ah, it's normal. No, even if you don't say it to the person, but you find that your heart pulls them out anyways, even if you don't communicate them, you just think them. Brother, sister, the Lord sees The Lord knows your thoughts. And imagine if he were to do that with us. We go to him, having wronged him for the thousandth time. We we repent, we want forgiveness, we want restoration. Imagine if he were to pull out a list of our wrongs. We would be buried under a litany of sins that his omniscience could recall in that moment. But he doesn't. Because he doesn't remember them? No. Well, in a sense, he doesn't. 
Because he doesn't know what we've done? No, he knows better than you and I what we have done. But because he loves us. Because the Lord loves sinners. And all sinners have sinned against him. All sin against anyone is sin against Christ, and yet he does not keep count of wrongs for those who come to him in repentance. So brother, sister, let us be like our master in this. He says, come, repent. I'll forgive. I'm faithful to forgive. He practices what he preaches in this text. He doesn't keep count of our wrongs, so we should not keep count of the wrongs of our brothers and sisters when they repent. Instead, let us keep count of their graces. Imagine that instead in your, your, your dealings with that person closest to you that you tend to do this with, that instead of being able to quickly recall their wrongs, you have on call the ways in which God is sanctifying them. Brother, thank you for bringing that up to me. And I just want to say, I have seen so much of the Lord's grace in your life. Even in this, coming to a brother and rebuking them for something that you think that they've done wrong, that's hard to do. This is an evidence of God's grace in your life. So, so thank you, uh, and let, let me internalize this and, and think over it, but I'm sorry if I've wronged you in any way. What a different way to act. What a way that's becoming of a Christian. So I think that's what Jesus' response commends for us. I think that Jesus wants us to be done with the scorecard, done keeping count, done with the the habit we have of of pulling up the wrongs of other people whenever we feel we have been wronged. So this is obviously a total reorientation of Peter's idea of sin and forgiveness within the body of Christ. In order to illustrate this, he gives a parable. So, number three. First was Peter's question, how many times should I forgive? Jesus' response, I say to you 77 times. Now, to illustrate this, Jesus gives us a parable. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, honestly, in the parable itself. I want to give a couple of remarks about parables, and then we'll make a couple of uh, notes of significant things in this parable. So let, let me read the parable portion again for us one time. Jesus says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So when we approach parables, parables can be tricky. They can be hard to understand. And I think one of the things that we we often do incorrectly when we approach parables is we start trying to make point-to-point connections between the parable and things in the real world. So we can be helped in this by just looking at the immediate context. So what comes right before the parable? What comes right after the parable? These are often very explanatory concerning what the parable's about. What's the point of this parable? And so this parable is sandwiched by two of these explanatory remarks. First, we have the exchange that we just looked at between Peter and Jesus. So we can assume this parable is going to be clarified or developing what Peter, has said, or what Peter has said to Jesus and what Jesus has responded to Peter. Also, at the end of the parable, we have an explanatory remark from Jesus as well. The so also, sort of a, a likewise, just like in the parable, so also, 
my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Both of those sort of sandwich this parable and give us explanation about what the parable is about. We don't have to go through the parable trying to dig up, okay, what is this referring to? What is that referring to? And this is just a general practice with parables. We don't need to find point-for-point corollaries between everything in the parable because that's going to lead us to some confusing conclusions. For instance, in this parable, we might be stuck asking, well, who are those fellow servants that reported this man to the king after they saw what he did? Who do those represent? You know, who, who reports our sin to God? But they're, they're fellow servants, they're, they're people like us, but hmm, what's that about? Or we could ask, uh, who are the jailers to whom the, the wicked man is given over? These plural, multiple jailers are... Uh, Does God sell people? Uh, Is that the punishment? Is there some sort of transaction happening there? So we we don't need to get caught up in all of those things uh, because I don't think that's what Jesus wants us to be asking at all. And I think that leads us into unprofitable conclusions. Instead, we should be asking, what is the main point of the parable? What is the one big idea that Jesus is trying to get across here? And he's just using these characters as characters in a story in order to communicate this one big idea. So that's what we need to be after, is what is this one big idea? With those general remarks about parables being said, uh, I just want to make a few observations about this parable. So we'll just note a few details from this parable before we move on to the conclusion that Jesus wants us to get from it. First, what's the main point? Uh, what, what idea is, is being communicated in this parable? What are we supposed to glean from it? I wonder if you may want to read back through the parable, because I think the main idea is clearly stated in one verse. So parents, maybe you want to do this with your kids. Maybe pause the video and read through the parable. Okay, what do we think that, what's the main idea here? So you may want to, you may want to do that for, uh, for just a moment here before I tell you. At the end of the parable, in my opinion, we have the clearest statement of the point of the parable. In verse 33... We have, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? So it's the king speaking to the the unforgiving servant. I think that's the, the whole point of the parable in one line. The king's question of the servant. Shouldn't you have had mercy on him how I had mercy on you? I think that's the whole point of the parable summarized in one question, one sentence from the king there. But notice the details of the parable and how they illustrate this point. How how the details of the parable bring this point to fruition. First of all, sin is apparently like owing a great debt. So we have have two debts in this parable. We have the the larger debt, which is 10,000 talents. Then we have the smaller debt, which is 100 denarii. So one debt owed to the king, one debt owed to a fellow servant. So, So I think the point here is we... We have sin debt against us, with God. We've sinned against God. We owe him a great debt, a large debt. We sin against fellow man as well. We sin against one another. Sinners sinning against sinners. A smaller debt, uh, not so large, but just as large in the fact that all sin against sinners is sin against the king, against God. The amounts here, the difference in the amounts in the parable, I think is one of the most uh, compelling points of the parable. So, 10,000 talents. Those of you that have an ESV, you may have footnoted there how much a talent is worth. So you have a little footnote, a little subscript down there at the bottom. One talent is equal to about 20 years' labor. 20 years' labor. One, a single talent. So think 20 years of your annual income. Pull out the calculator. Annual income times 20. That's one single talent. This man owes 10,000 talents. 10,000 20 years labors. So again, if we want to put a literal number on it, the number we're talking about here is 200,000 years of wages. But the word that's used here in Greek, the word for for 10,000, is the highest number that can be expressed in the Greek language with a single word. 
Say it again. The number that's used there for 10,000 is the highest number that can be expressed in a single word in Greek. And it's often, for that reason, it's often used as sort of an immeasurable number. Innumerable. Think of the word like zillions in English. Oh, there's, oh, there's zillions of them. If someone were to ask, oh, zillions, how many is zillions? Oh, it's not a real number. We're just saying that it, I mean, you can't really count them. It's just innumerable. That's what's happening here. The, the, the point isn't, again, the, the literal number, just like it wasn't the literal number with Jesus' response 77 times. The point here isn't the literal number. The point here is innumerable sin, innumerable debt, unable to pay back, no matter what his resources are, unable to pay back the debt. Versus 100 denarii. So denarius is, think, a day's wage. So three months and some change of wages versus 200,000 years of wages. This is the, the disparity, the difference that Jesus is trying to highlight between the sin that has been done against us the 100 denarii, and the sin that we have committed against God. So, just reflect for a moment. Sins of thought, sins of motive, willful sin, delight in the misfortune of others, evil things that we have said, sins that we don't even know about, that are mixed in with all of our purest motives to taint them with sin. All of these things for the years and years of your life are just adding up a great innumerable debt against the king. Interesting here that Jesus is picturing God as king. Uh, That's a, a very Matthew sort of concept, king and kingdom. But our sin is like a great debt that we owe to a king, a debt that we will never be able to pay back even if we had the resources and even so, we have nothing with which to pay. Note also, what moves the king to forgiveness? One word, pity. The king felt pity for this man. Nothing good in the man, nothing the man can offer, but because of the pity that the king feels, He disregards the servant's debt. He forgives it. Don't even worry about it. He doesn't say, all right, fine, I'll give you the opportunity to pay me back. The king says, your debt's forgiven. Go freely. Can you imagine the weight that must have been lifted off the servant? Uh, uh, Thousands of lifetimes of servitude forgiven. Go and be free. The king even disregards the servant's offer to pay it back. The servant didn't ask for forgiveness. The servant said, just be patient. Just wait a little longer. I'll pay you all I owe. He's not going to be able to pay what he owes. The king knows that. The king disregards that offer. Just, you're forgiven. What great grace. And yet... The servant does not show the same pity when he is in the same situation with an infinitely smaller debt. So clearly, the point of the parable has been shown. Remember our main point, verse 33. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant the same way I had mercy on you? Don't you realize that the the magnitude of mercy that has been shown you and you're not going to show mercy to him for three months and some change? So the point of the parable has clearly been shown. Now, finally, we've seen Peter's question. We saw Jesus' response. We saw the, the parable itself. Let's look at Jesus' conclusion. What conclusion does Jesus draw to this parable? Notice the first line of the parable in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts. The kingdom of heaven may be, may be compared to this. Common language in Matthew's gospel. As in, if you are like this wicked, unforgiving servant, 
You have no part in the kingdom of heaven. This is not what kingdom of heaven people are like. My heavenly Father will deliver you over for punishment if you don't sincerely forgive your brother from your heart. But if you're like this wicked, unforgiving servant, my heavenly Father will do to you exactly as was done to him by the king. This is extremely significant. Let me read his words. Jesus says, I'll read the the last part of what the king did. And in his anger, the king, the master, delivered him over to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I don't want to soften Jesus' words here. Even though when we hear things like this, and things like this are common if you've spent much time in the Gospels. Jesus says the same thing about lust. If your eye causes you to sin, if your your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to go into life maimed than with your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus uses this sort of language pretty frequently in the Gospels. And so our first impulse shouldn't be to systematize it away. We should let the, the words of Jesus rest on us there. And even notice the escalation that Jesus gives. In the parable, forgiveness is just a transaction. You owed me money. I forgive your debt. That's forgiveness. I'm not going to collect the money. It's pretty clear what forgiveness is in that situation. Jesus escalates it, as he often does, to the heart level of things. Jesus says, my father will do the same thing to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So insincere forgiveness doesn't cut it with Jesus here. According to Jesus, failure to offer forgiveness to others from the heart, so forsaking malice and ill thought of the people, failure to offer forgiveness shows a complete disregard for the mercy that God has shown in forgiving your sin. And God does not appreciate for his mercy to be disregarded. Note, Jesus doesn't say that it's us committing sins that is a disregard of God's mercy. Because we're going to sin, we repent. that's, That's claiming God's mercy. It's failure to forgive the sins of others when we're the one being sinned against. That's a disregard of his mercy. Benjamin Keach um, an old Baptist, early Baptist theologian says that withholding forgiveness will be two things. An evidence to our souls that God has indeed not forgiven us as well as a bar against such forgiveness. So unforgiveness, unforgiving spirit, it evidences we have not ourselves understood or taken advantage of the forgiveness that is offered by God. And two, unforgiveness is a bar against us ever taking advantage of such forgiveness. John Piper says about this passage, if the forgiveness that we received at the cost of the blood of God's Son, so if the forgiveness that we received at the cost of the blood of God's Son is so ineffective in our hearts that we're bent on holding unforgiving grudges and bitterness against someone else, then we are simply not a good tree. We're not saved. End quote. Matthew Henry again. Those who forgive their brethren and those only may, be expect, to be, may expect to be forgiven of God. And then last thing I'll read here, James chapter 2, verse 18. James says, he will have judgment without mercy who shows no mercy. So the message of Jesus, the message of James is if you withhold mercy from others, don't expect God to be merciful towards you. That's a terrifying conclusion. We should feel it as such. So, This should be the standard that we use to navigate situations in which we've been sinned against. We should think this way. He, I, will have judgment without mercy from God if I show no mercy. 
So, okay, we should think, let me exercise the same sort of mercy, forgiveness, and lavish grace with this repentant brother, repentant sister, as I hope to receive myself from God as a repentant sinner. Let me imagine the grace, the mercy, the the forgiveness that I hope to be shown by God on the last day and duplicate that as best I can with my wife, husband, brother, sister, friend, church member. We should seek to duplicate, to replicate the forgiveness that we have received and hope to receive from God as we are dealing with people who have sinned against us. I think that's Jesus' conclusion here. And to, and to do less is to evidence that you have no place in the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven, people are forgiving people. And if you are not a forgiving person, if you hold on to unforgiveness, you should consider whether or not you are a kingdom, have, a kingdom of heaven person. In closing here, I want to just ask two questions. First question, how do I know if I'm somebody who struggles with this? Because you you, you may sit here and hear something like this, and you may think, okay, I'm looking at myself, and I I don't really see that this is a big problem. I mean, I don't feel any malice towards anybody particularly. I mean, there's no 20-year grudges that I'm holding on to. I don't really understand people that hold on to grudges that long. I find it pretty easy to let go of things. Or you may be someone who says, I I do struggle with this. This this is a habitual sin of of mine. I find it really hard to let go of things. I I hold grudges. I I withhold forgiveness. I want people to know when I'm upset at them. I, I recognize that this is something that I struggle with. And then others, maybe in a third group, where you say, this isn't something that I mean I, I habitually struggle with. It's like I'm withholding forgiveness left and right. But when I hear about forgiveness, when I hear about how I should forgive other people, I, I think of one face, or maybe two faces, or one event, or one place, or one group of people one thing that happened in my past that I'm finding it, I've always found it really, really hard to let go of. And there's still scars on my life because of what that person or that group did to me. I find it really hard to let go of that. And they're not even sorry for what they did. I want to briefly address all all three groups. First, those of you who say... I don't really see this as something that I struggle with. I mean, there are other areas in which I really do struggle. I'm not trying to boast or anything, but I just think this is an area in which God has graced me that I don't really struggle with holding grudges against people. With a sin like unforgiveness, we tend to think, well, sitting here right now, I don't feel malice towards anybody, and I don't know of any decade or 20 or 30 year long grudges that I've been holding on to. So I guess, no, I don't really struggle with unforgiveness. But how about in the moment when you're wronged? Your wife, your best friend, your husband, a family member wrongs you, genuinely wrongs you in a way that makes you upset, frustrated, maybe even feel betrayed. You know you're not going to hold on to that for 10 years but you might decide to hold on to it for 10 hours or 10 days. You may make the decision. Watch your heart in these situations. You may make the decision to say, you know what? She wronged me. He shouldn't have said that to me. She shouldn't have used that tone with me in front of people. I'm going to be a little icy tonight. The rest of the evening, I'm going to be a little distant. Why? I want to make him, I want to make her, I want to make them feel my displeasure. I want them to know that I haven't let go of what they did earlier today. You hear it? Haven't let go? That's unforgiveness. 
That's cho- willfully choosing to not extend mercy and grace when you have been extended infinite mercy and grace. And I'm not just pointing at you. I do the same thing. How do you think I'm able to describe that situation other than I know those thoughts in my own heart? We do this. So don't just think of unforgiveness as some big, grand thing. But when you, when you I want to let them know what they said to me a couple days ago, I'm not over that yet. I want them to feel my displeasure. It's unforgiveness. It's the same strain of unforgiveness that Jesus has highlighted here. It's present in big, grand, colossal situations. It's also present in those little, tiny situations, and we should repent. We shouldn't give those thoughts a place to land in our hearts because we may find that they'll breed more like them if we allow them to stay. Those of you who say, yeah, other group, uh, second group, you may say, you know what, I, I see this as a problem. I, I, I genuinely do. I, I really do have a hard time with holding grudges. I, or maybe in what I just described, you now say, oh goodness, I do have a problem with forgiving people. I don't hold on to it for 10 years, but I, I hold on to it for 10 hours, for sure. I'm not going to go to bed on my wrath, maybe, but I'm, I'm going to make them feel that displeasure until bedtime then maybe we'll have some sort of apology if they come to me first. Repent. Repent. Go to Jesus and ask forgiveness for being such a hypocrite because that's what we are when we do that. We are hypocrites. We are, we are very content to accept mercy but unwilling to extend it. So repent. Repent. And then show to others the same mercy that Jesus shows you when you repent. The third group. Those who have one event, one person, one horrific thing that was done to me. A way that I was misused or somehow I was was treated wrongly. Lingering unforgiveness. Two brief preface comments. First of all, though this passage, Matthew 18, is primarily dealing with sin within the local body, between brothers and sisters who are repentant towards one another, there's plenty of biblical warrant to show we should have the same heartfelt, forgiving attitude towards unbelievers who wrong us and towards those who are not even repentant for what they've done. If you want an example of that, look no further than Jesus on the cross. While they are reviling him, what is his posture towards them? Father, forgive. Second preface comment. There's a difference in forgiveness, as Jesus describes it here, and relational reconciliation. Here's what I mean by that. So, for instance, you you can forgive someone who commits murder without going to the judge and saying, hey, they should be set free, they should be loose in society again. You can allow and even encourage the state to give the necessary consequences and necessary justice for certain actions that have been done while still forgiving the person from your heart and holding no ill will or malice toward that person. So don't think when we're talking about forgiveness for some group or some person that has wronged you in a severe way, the nature of that sin may call for irreparable change in the relationship, but that doesn't preclude forgiveness. In that situation, those of you who find yourselves there, imagine the most colossal wrong that could possibly be committed against you. The worst thing humanly possible. Consider that merely by the fact of you being a creature and God being the creator, that wrong, that colossal, huge, can't get worse sort of wrong against you does not compare to a single sin, much less the the, the amount of sins that you have committed against your creator. And I don't say that to you to be harsh. 
I say that to you to set you free. That the sin you have committed, consider brother, consider sister, that the sin you have committed against God is qualitatively different than the sin that's been committed against you. It's qualitatively worse. It's also quantitatively worse. Maybe this group sinned against you a dozen times or a hundred times. It's yet to be a drop in the bucket of what you, brother, sister, have done against your God. And you have not shown that person nearly the mercy and grace that God has shown you. They don't have nearly the reasons to be kind towards you and amiable towards you as you do towards God, as I do towards God. So consider how different the sin that they have committed against you is from the sin that you've committed against God. And we see that in the parable, right? 200,000 years versus three months and a little bit of change. You may feel, person in that situation, that you're the victim. You're not like that unforgiving servant. He was in the wrong, clearly the guy in the parable. But in my situation, I was the one wronged. And that's true. Remember Peter's question. We're talking about sins against me. Sins against you. Brother, sister, you were sinned against. But by refusing to grant forgiveness, by refusing to lay down the malice and ill will that you may feel towards that person or that group, you become the sinner in the situation. So by making yourself the arbiter of which sins get forgiveness and which sins don't, you yourself sin. So instead, forgive. I said I wanted to close with two questions. Here's the last one. This will be brief. First question was, how do I know if this is something that I struggle with? Second question, how do I forgive? I mean, I, maybe I want to forgive this person. Maybe I want to be a person that's more forgiving. How do I do it? What does Jesus give here as the motivation for forgiveness? Two things, two prongs, two motivators that Jesus gives. And this is so common in Scripture. Life, death, blessing, cursing. The promise of blessing over here, the threat of cursing so often lives side by side in the Bible. And we see the same thing here. First, the cursing, the warning, death. As the king dealt with the unforgiving servant, so the father will deal with you if your heart is unforgiving towards your brother. Perhaps you have not considered how seriously God takes unforgiveness. It is apparently an eternally serious matter. So, use that. That's a motivation for forgiveness. Consider how seriously the Father takes, how seriously Jesus takes unforgiveness. I mean, I don't want to run away from that. I don't want to give unforgiveness a harbor here. Jesus and the Father hate it so much. Or, secondly, perhaps you haven't thought long and hard on the nature of your forgiveness. This is the, the comfort There's a warning, there's a comfort to motivate us to forgive. You've been forgiven 200,000 years worth of sin. Innumerable forgiveness. Your sins, though great, have been forgiven. In light of such grace, Christians are the only people that should be able to truly forgive someone who has wronged us. So you say, how do I forgive? Consider the threat that Jesus gives, the warning that Jesus gives here. Take it seriously. Two, consider the great grace that God has shown to you. Think long when you sin on how good is the news that there is forgiveness for me. Grab hold of that. Duplicate it in in your dealings with those who have sinned against you. So, Jesus would tell us here, if we deal with unforgiveness, if we find it hard, if we find it difficult to let go of wrongs against us, even in a situation 
like the one we're in now with the coronavirus. A lot of normal rhythms have been disrupted. A lot of time spent together that may be difficult. A lot of extra work for some people that may make them just pressured and frustrated and irritable. Even in these situations, Jesus would tell us, as you have been forgiven, forgive. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the forgiveness that's offered to us by Christ. We thank you that we have a way to live peaceably with others, even those who wrong us. God, thank you so much for the forgiveness we have from Jesus. Enable us to forgive as you have forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen.